Hello and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. One of the topics that, that's been really hot again this summer has been cover crops. We're going to discuss this and if it's the right fit for your farm. We're also going to talk about late season, and in this case, very late season, fungicide and insecticide applications in soybeans. Will they still pay on your farm? We'll talk about that today. We also have a tough to control weed of the week, but first, here's our Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. One of the things every farmer has to deal with at one point or another is compaction. Today we'll talk a little about how we manage compaction on our farm. When you think about soil, you want to have kind of fluffy, tilthy soil. That way your root system has a nice easy path to move down and find nutrients and so forth. But when that soil is compacted, it's hard. You forced out a lot of the air in the soil and packed those soil particles tight. There are three big things we look at here. Number one is drainage. We have to have good drainage. If the water table is too high, that soil is going to compact much easier. So in our case, we have drain tile in the wetter areas, not in all areas of every field or anything like that, but at least in the wetter areas just to keep the water table down. That's number one. We also look at how much organic matter do we have. Ideally, I'm shooting for five, if not six percent organic matter and then the third thing is good calcium levels we'd really like to have around 70 75 80 percent calcium calcium is a much bigger molecule than magnesium if we have lots of calcium we have a more porous soil well here's another thing that a farmer can control when he goes out in the field when you're going to drive a tractor out into a field, you've got a lot of weight there, right? A, a tractor's big and it's heavy. Well, that weight is going to be spread out by the tires or by the tracks that the farmer uses to carry that tractor across the field. Now, if you're out there and the soil is too wet, clearly you're going to press that soil down and you're going to cause compaction when that soil has the proper amount of air in it and it's dry enough like Brian was kind of talking about there when that soil is dry well that can handle that load you think about it if you walk through uh, you know just some dirt and it's muddy well you're going to make deep footprints out there and pack things down if it's dry you're hardly even going to know you walked across it. Darren mentioned tracks and tires we do have a lot of farmers that have gone to tracks to reduce compaction action, but a farmer can also just lower the pressure, the air pressure in his tires and reduce compaction that way as well. Well, so. think about it with your bike tire. If your bike tire doesn't have enough air, what happens? Well, it squishes out and that's exactly what happens to these tractor tires. So now that weight is spread out over more square inches reducing the pounds per square inch of pressure. So there are a lot of tires that are designed to run on very low air pressure, spread that weight out, and that does reduce compaction. So I, I guess the other big thing that I wanted to talk about here is once compaction is in the ground, now what do you do? Well, again, I'm certainly going to look at building organic matter, increasing calcium levels, improving drainage. But the other thing that we do on our farm is some deep tillage. What we'll do is go out with straight shanks, narrow points, not totally turning everything over, but at least making some slices through the compacted areas. We're running 30 inch centers down to about 20 inches deep, or at least below the deepest level of compaction. And that does absolutely help on our farm. Well, hard compacted soil is not good for your lawn, your garden, or certainly not for farmers' fields. Farmers are addressing this in a variety of ways, trying to wait until the field is fit to drive out in there so we don't pack that ground down, and then spreading the weight of equipment like tractors out over more square inches uh, to, to be softer onto the soil. That way it leaves more tilth in the ground and it's easier for the root system to grow. Whether you have compaction or not, you may have our Weed of the Week. We'll tell you how to stop it coming up later in the show. 
Introducing the SoilMax ZD48, the newest addition to the SoilMax Gold Digger lineup. The first plow designed for smaller class tractors, the ZD48 has been tested on tractors weighing between 10,000 and 16,000 pounds with excellent results. Designed for row crop farms, vineyards, irrigation, and specialty crop farms. The SoilMax ZD48 will install tile up to 48 inches deep as well as install 3 or 4 inch tile. The ZD48 truly opens up the world of tile installation to more farms than ever before. Increase your productivity with Hypro's dual React control system. The dual nozzle body design allows you to drive at the speed you want while maintaining the rate and droplet size you need. Hypro, helping you spray better. With the success of the Case IH Diger Quad Track and Magnum Road Track tractors, it's no secret why Case IH is the leader of the track. So it wasn't surprising when the competition started imitating us because Case IH offered the first five axle design to give you more power to the ground, less berming and compaction, all to help you be more productive. Still, we're flattered. In fact, if we weren't already red, <laughs> we'd be blushing. Leading the charge in strip tillage for more than a decade, the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm today. Unlock your nutrient investment with QuickRoots technology. It contains two powerful microbes that can help free nutrients bound in your soil, which can improve access to key nutrients for healthy crops, N, P, and K. Applying QuickRoots technology to seed can lead to improved root and shoot growth, increased yield potential, and maximized nutrient investment. See how you can make your fertilizer dollar go further at MonsantoBioAg.com slash QuickRoots. I don't know how many farmers I've talked to over the last few years that said, oh, I've got this secret recipe, this thing that I do on my soybeans. I don't even want anybody else to know about this because it's working so well. I'm putting on a fungicide and I'm also putting insecticide on at the same time and man, I'm getting some good yield response from that. You know, it's not only yield, but the other big thing we talk about here all the time in Ag PhD is we have to make money on the farm. Since insecticide and fungicide prices have crashed in the last five years, well now all of a sudden it's really economical. And I understand that soybean prices aren't where they were just a few months ago. But still, even if soybeans were $5 a bushel, if you only have to spend a couple bucks on insecticide and you can spend as little as three to five dollars on fungicide, boy, that is not very much money you have invested in that crop. Let me start with the insecticide part of this first because honestly, if you uh, talk to anyone in the industry, if you talk to university experts, this is the area where they're a little bit concerned that farmers would just spray insecticide even when they don't see bugs in the field. We're not in favor of that. We would suggest scouting your fields first finding out if you have any harmful pests out there. Then you'll start determining, well, are there enough bugs for me to worry about it? Let's say, for example, you had one soybean aphid in the entire field. Well, you'd say, okay, I did find a harmful bug, but he's not at a level that's gonna cause me any economic loss. When you think about what insecticides cost, two to three dollars an acre for the most part, depending on what bug you're trying to kill, well, if you only need to justify two to three dollars of yield loss before you go out and spray and you say, well, it's going to cost me another three or four bucks to spray the field. Fine. Let's just say it's one bushel. If you could get one bushel more soybeans, it's going to pay you at least a two to one return on your investment. That doesn't take many bugs out there, but it does take some. So you want to scout and make sure you've got a harmful bug out there that you need to control or a combination of several harmful bugs then it's worth putting the insecticide in. That was where I was going next because we've been out in our fields this year. For example, normally we're looking for aphids and bean leaf beetles. Well, guess what? This year we've seen grasshoppers. We've seen stink bugs. We have also seen Japanese beetles. So some insects that we don't normally see, we don't have a lot of those. But, you know, by the time you add all these different insects, these harmful insects up, 
that's a real problem. Besides that, it's not just the feeding damage that they do. In fact, if you want to look at how much feeding damage actually hurts the crop, most of the time it's not much. Just look at the hail charts. Just look at any hail studies that have been done in the past at the different stages of growth that a soybean crop is at, or for that matter, any crop, and you'll see, boy, it takes a lot of defoliation to actually hurt yield. But here's what happens. When that feeding occurs, not only is the plant opened up for just any random disease that could show up, but also quite often we'll find some of these insects are carriers for certain diseases. So that's the real problem. It's not just the defoliation, it's the injection of disease into the plant. Let me give you an example. Bean pod model virus. Wow, that's a virus. That's not a fungus and it's not a bacterial disease. We've got no answer for that. Once you have bean pod model virus and it's getting spread out there by bean leaf beetles or whatever bug would happen to be a vector for that virus, well, you can't stop it. So when you see harmful bugs that could be containing uh, some sort of virus or disease like this, you've got to stop the bug to protect your plants. You can run with a cheap pyrethroid. That's generally speaking our recommendation. But if you've got insects resistant to that cheap pyrethroid, you may have to go with something like a bifenthrin. Uh, that's kind of the next level of pyrethroid. Or you could go with Lorsvan and organophosphate or some other insecticide out there or some kind of combination. Whichever way you go, most of these insecticides are really, really inexpensive. Like Darren said, two to three dollars. You might spend as much as four to five if you do some fancy combination of multiple modes of action. The next thing you want to be looking for in your fields is disease. Now, if you're already seeing a bunch of disease out there, you're too late with the fungicides. You've already given up some yield. But you want to identify what kind of disease you have. You can take a look at the free Ag PhD Soybean Diseases app. We put that together along with the American Phytopathological Society to show you all these different diseases that could potentially be out there in your soybean field. Uh, you can look, you can try to identify what you got. Let's just say, for example, that frog eye leaf spot is really common in your area or you're concerned that that may be moving into your soybean crop. You have to get that preventative fungicide out in advance. Now, the ideal time to spray starts once you get into the reproductive phases. So R1, first flower, is the time where your soybeans are really under a lot of stress and they're more susceptible to these types of fungal pathogens moving in. Now, you're going to spray a fungicide and think, all right, I'm good now, right? Keep in mind that fungicide only protects the tissue that you sprayed it on. So if you have new growth, new trifoliates, these types of things, they're unprotected and you'll have to be coming back every couple of weeks if you have a lot of disease pressure in your area. Darren mentioned spraying early, spraying at the beginning of reproductive stages, spraying preventatively. All those things are great, but here we are late in the season. So the question is, is it still worth it to spray fungicide? Well, in many areas of the country, I, I know certainly in our farm, we have been exceptionally wet. We have a tremendous amount of dew every single morning. There absolutely is going to be a lot of disease out there this year. So yes, we already did our early treatments, but you know what? We're coming back again. We need it again. We also talk about, hey, when the crop is small, you can sometimes get by with lower rates. If the crop is really big, especially here over the next few weeks, if we're talking about a really big crop, you're probably going to have to run full rate. So you might spend a little bit more money. Also, we would ask you to consider using multiple modes of action. Now, there are several that are inexpensive. You can also go with more of a Cadillac program. It just depends on what you want to do. So I can think of a number of different products that I would consider here kind of at the top end, like let's say it's Preaxor or Trivapro, Stratego Yield, a bunch of really good ones. You also could take some generic products and mix those together to have two or three modes of action. But the key thing here is we just want you to take a look at what do I have for potential on my farm in terms of yield and also in terms of disease. If you're saying, hey, I've got good yield potential, I have a lot of moisture, I very well could have disease, it's probably going to be worthwhile to spray fungicide. When you do that, if you have almost any bugs out there, you're already making the trip across the field. So all we're saying is insecticide, if it's only two or three dollars, you don't have to have many bugs to spray. And I can just tell you on our farm, almost every year for the last 15 years, we've used fungicide and insecticide and had great results, and a lot of people around the country have as well. While you're out scouting your fields, you may notice our Weed of the Week. Can you identify this week's weed? 
Your planter is the single most important piece of equipment on your farm. Because without a uniform stand, you can't reach maximum yield. That's why Harvest International set out to design a planter that takes advantage of the newest innovations in planter technology. Built tough for high speed and integrated with the latest precision enhancements, Harvest International planters ensure every seed you plant today puts more in your bin at harvest. Harvest International, planting the future. This agro liquid line is something special. A lot of really impressive playmakers. Take a look at Sure K. This guy is an enigma. But wrap your head around the exceptionally high plant response when compared to conventional potassium sources, the research proven plant availability, plus flexible application options and mixing capabilities. Really stellar performance stats. Sure K is a true standout, and that's a winning goal on any field. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt and a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. Are you looking to make a career in an ag-related field? The Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation is pleased to offer a $2,500 scholarship for students enrolled in an agricultural program for the 2018-2019 school year. The goal with this scholarship is to further the education of students who understand the importance of proper stewardship and responsible nutrient management for agriculture and society as a whole. To learn more and apply, visit rnmf.org scholarship before October 15th. Are you looking for an easy way to apply dry powdered products to your stored grain? Do you want to use the applicator recommended by industry leaders for products like Diacon D and other dry powder products? Changing Time CT applicators successfully apply a diversity of products quickly, easily, and accurately. The innovative CT applicators are designed to give you the most accurate application of products such as talc, inoculants, fertilizers, and other dry products. For commercial use or on the farm, you need the applicator industry leaders are using. CT applicators for the changing times. Getting a lot of questions about cover crops once again, whether it's for the guys who just got done harvesting small grains or even in some corn and soybean growing areas where they just got flooded out and want to put something in there in those spots in the fields to have something growing. There are a lot of uses and potential benefits from cover crops. Well, there are, but the thing that I always caution people about is if you're in a far northern climate and you're going to harvest really late, there probably isn't enough time. You really want to have at least 60 days of growth in order to make cover crops worthwhile in a lot of cases. Okay, the next thing that we talk about is which cover crops are you going to use? We would encourage you to at least consider a blend. Okay. In a lot of cases, it's just the exact opposite of what we talk about out in fields because every once in a while we'll have somebody that'll say, well, I'm trying to do this grass mixed together with alfalfa for my livestock. And we go, Ugh, I, you're way ahead to raise alfalfa totally separately from grass. We want those separate because we can raise more total tons when they are each produced separately because they're totally different crops. Well, with cover crops, all we're trying to do here really, when you start thinking about it, is build the soil. If we're just trying to build the soil, hold the weeds down, that type of thing, having a blend is just fine. What we usually talk about is, let's get a grass out there, a broadleaf out there, and maybe to a broadleaf that is a legume that can actually help produce nitrogen for that soil. The other question we get is, well, I used a herbicide on my previous crop, uh, is it going to be safe for my cover crop? And honestly, we don't really care. If you're using a blend, you've got a number of different species out there that you're planting. Most of the pre's are specific, either to broadleaf or to grasses. So we don't get uh, many pre-emerge herbicides that are going to kill everything in a cover crop blend. Now, they may damage a little bit one species, but think about it. Does it really matter? Maybe it's your legume. Let's just say your legume in that blend, well, instead of getting a 100% stand, you only get an 80% stand. 
well, it's going to be just fine for a cover crop. It, it's not a big deal. Now, if that was your actual crop and you said, well, I got an 80% stand, well, you're probably disappointed and you may have given up some yield. One of the things we've seen this year across the country, uh, especially in the northern part of the United States, is a lot of drown out areas. In those drown out areas, if you don't get something growing there yet this year, you're most likely going to have fallow syndrome next year. In other words, a lot of those fungi that are beneficial to the crop that actually can help bring nutrients like phosphorus into the crop next year, they're going to die. So you've got to get something for them to feed on the rest of this year. You're going to raise a lot better crop next year if you do that. Whenever possible, we like to see a growing crop out in the field as long as we can. That's where cover crops come into play. You may have more questions about them. There's certainly lots of resources online and in your local area too that you can check into, but we do encourage you plant a blend. Get it planted as soon as you can so you have the longest amount of time for it to grow in your field. Another place you can go to find good information on cover crops is agphd.com. While you're at agphd.com, you can learn more about weed control as well, like our Weed of the Week. We'll tell you how to stop it on your farm coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough, but we're tougher with unrivaled weed control, reduced drift, and near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> Weed of the Week is Fall Panicum. Fall Panicum is a summer annual weed. Now when we think about that, there's a couple things that are important there. The first part is summer. So when we say a summer annual weed, it's basically a warmer season grass. So it's not going to germinate really early in the spring. And we'll talk about that when it comes to pre-emerge herbicides and effectiveness on this weed. The other part of that description was annual weed. That means it's got a one year life cycle. So if we can stop it from going to seed, we may not have as many of these to fight next year. All right, when we look at fall panicum, a lot of people get this confused with other grasses. Let's start with this. Fall panicum has a hairy ligule. So that's immediately going to separate it from weeds it does get confused with, like barnyard grass, for example. Barnyard grass has no ligule. You can also look at Johnson grass. Well, Johnson grass has a perennial root system. So again, this fall panicum is just an annual. You can absolutely get it under control on your farm, but you're going to want to start with a pre-emerge herbicide. All right, in corn, this is where we historically have had some trouble with fall panicum control. You can use the pre's uh, like a dual outlook, harness, surpass, those kinds of things that are mainly grass killers and use them at a full rate. And you can do okay on fall panicum, but the problem is we've gone to all these combination products where we're using a cut rate to the grass herbicide and adding in some broadleaf killer. Well, it's not only that, but you spray that pre emerge herbicide really early. If this is a summer annual, it comes up several weeks after that pre emerge herbicide has been applied. So yeah, if you use a cut rate and now, hey, a lot of that product is already gone by the time the fall panicum is ready to germinate, we've got a problem. So back in the conventional corn days, and for some of you, you're still on conventional corn, we would use Accent or even Accent and Beacon in combination, but we'd have to get the fall panicum when it was really, really small in order to be effective. There are a lot of people talking about going back to conventional corn now, and there is a certain percent in the United States that have done that, but the downside of that is Roundup or Liberty, that makes a great rescue program for all grasses, including fall panicum. Now, back when we didn't have Roundup Ready crops, we would look at soybeans as the option to, okay, I can now clean up my fall panicum. I could use Treflan, Sonlan, or Prowl Down. They're gonna do a pretty good job. And the post grass killers over the top, whether it's uh, Clethodim or 
uh, secure. Well, clethodem is by far clethodem is by far the best. A sure two or secure would be next. Okay, then when we get into the wheat part of the rotation, we've got some good choices. If we go with a pre-emerge like Prepare, for example, we can hold it down. We get great crop canopy out of wheat early. We can choke that fall panicum out. If there is a little that gets through, we could use Axial to clean it up. Well, that's it for our Weed of the Week fall panicum, but stay tuned. Iron Talk is coming up next. Morton is eager to make the building you've always dreamed of a reality. Visit us online at mortonbuildings.com. Introducing the SoilMax ZD48, the newest addition to the SoilMax Gold Digger lineup. The first plow designed for smaller class tractors, the ZD48 has been tested on tractors weighing between 10,000 and 16,000 pounds with excellent results. Designed for row crop farms, vineyards, irrigation, and specialty crop farms. The SoilMax ZD48 will install tile up to 48 inches deep as well as install 3 or 4 inch tile. The ZD48 truly opens up the world of tile installation to more farms than ever before. Let's take a look at our picks for the championship season. We've got 10-34-0. No, no, no. I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about this Agro Liquid team. Take a look at this lineup. They got it all. The talent, their players can meet any challenge on any field. The coaching staff, the best I've seen. So that's your pick? No discussions? Nope. Agro Liquid is the team. They're going all the way to the championship. <laughs> Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. With the success of the Case IH Tiger Quad Track and Magnum Road Track tractors, it's no secret why Case IH is the leader of the track. So it wasn't surprising when the competition started imitating us because Case IH offered the first five axle design to give you more power to the ground, less berming and compaction, all to help you be more productive. Still, we're flattered. In fact, if we weren't already red, <laughs> we'd be blushing. Stopping tough to kill weeds and eliminating the green bridge between wheat crops are both critical, but how should you set your sprayer up to accomplish those tasks? We'll discuss on today's Iron Talk. Burn down applications following a wheat crop often involve Roundup plus either Dicamba or 2,4-D. With all of these products, physical drift is a concern, and with the Dicamba and the old formulations of 2,4-D, we're also worried about potential volatility, especially after the issues with Dicamba seen across the country the last couple of years. Controlling droplet size is important, and using tips like the Hypro ULD Ultra Low Drift tips can help keep physical drift to a minimum. Keeping spray volume towards the lower side helps to keep the droplets concentrated with product, which improves control when weeds are small. When weeds are bigger, this may not be as much of a concern because you can land more product on them. Keeping ground speed down to 15 miles or less is also important to help minimize drift. Finally, keeping your boom height low is critical to minimizing drift potential as well. Depending on your nozzles, spray pattern, and weed height, you should aim for your boom to be no more than two feet above what you're spraying. As for volatility, it's clear the industry has had some issues with dicamba and that's being addressed. However, the new 2,4-D products have performed very well. Freelex and Enlist Duo both contain the new 2,4-D choline, which is such an upgrade over the esters and amines that we've used for 40 years. I hate to even call these new products 2,4-Ds. We used both Freelex and Enlist Duo on our farm and have for a number of years now, and we've just had no issues whatsoever. I'd recommend them every time and never recommend using ester or amine again. The volatility reduction is just that big of a deal. 
So follow all these guidelines and consider using the new formulations at 2,4-D where you need a boost on your burndown application and you'll be more effective on the weeds and less likely to affect anything outside your field. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. This is a big week for us here at Ag PhD. It's the Ag PhD Field Day coming up Thursday, July 26th. We hope you can join us. Just go to agphd.com to learn more and to pre-register for this free event. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.